Hey, everybody, what's going on? It's Thursday night. Welcome to Tone Talk with Mark Uzanski and Dave Friedman. Uh, it's episode 90, and we've got mm -hmm. a fantastic, fantastic guest with us. Uh, he's a musician, composer, guitar player, multi-Grammy winner. Uh, one of my favorite artists he plays guitar for, Pat Benatar. Um, Neil, Neil Giraldo. How are you? you did it. All right. Did. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> you almost tripped yourself. I know. <laughs> You're thinking about it too much. I yeah, know. you can't think. Don't think. Yeah. <laughs> How you been? I'm great. I'm great. How you guys doing? Good, good. Thanks for joining us. And Dave, Thanks for how are you doing? Me. I'm doing fine. It's the same as the last eight months or so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. Repeat, now. rinse and repeat over and over and over again. Yeah. 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 I don't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No doubt. Well, I want to say hi to everybody in the chat who's watching us. Happy New Year. Um, we haven't had a show since uh, mid-December, I guess. So it's been a while since we've been live with folks. Um, Neil, I imagine you've been home. Uh, you haven't been on the road. You haven't been doing much gigs. Uh, have you been doing a lot of these types of live stream types of things? Or Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah, I do because uh, I have a spirits company and uh, I do a lot of calls for them. And my team, I have a great team of uh, workers out there, field people, and uh, it's just a great, it's a great organization. We'll get into that later, but it's it's phenomenal. I got a music ambassadorship that I started with that. Actually, one of uh, one of the guys named Bass Reeves, not Superman, no, not uh, Lone Ranger, Bass mm -hmm. Reeves, um, he started, he came up with the idea, and I, I took it on, and I think it's a great idea. So we'll get into that a little bit later. So oh, that's but, cool. Yeah, do a lot of these, yeah. Oh, awesome. Cool. Great. Awesome. That's why you have everything arranged so nicely behind you. Oh, do you think it works out? <laughs> okay. Well, I have to I think. think. I think it's got great visuals. Well, here, wait. I got to tell you why. I, I, I. It actually looks a little better than it has in the past. My friend Drew Carey. I did a show for Little Stephen uh, for the the, the school uh, the the give back program they do for teach school teach rock, and uh, my camera was so bad and looked so horrible on YouTube. And Drew looked great, and he uses glasses all the time. I said, how could you have glasses with no glare? He goes, and I'll show you. So he taught me how to do it. So I got oh, to think. Now, now you got to tell me. Yeah, I was going to say. And, and me, I don't know, I got you got glare, yeah. yeah. You, you got to get some side lighting going on, I think, is what you need. Uh, I do, I've got lights up here on either side. but You shouldn't be glaring. You see, there's no glare going on here. No, no glare. Yeah. We yeah. get glare from the screens a lot, you know. And Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I have to work on that. Better lighting. That's cool. That's yeah. That's a good suggestion. That, yeah, well, I like what you your little setup that you got there. That's cool. Well, thank you. Yeah, I got a bunch of stuff hanging around the background. Oh, this is my studio. The other way around. If if we flip it around, this is a. I have a, a sort of a writing production suite I have in uh, my house here in Southern California, and then I have a larger studio in the barn in another part in Southern California as well. This is more just my little uh, capsule. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, I have everything, keyboards and you know, guitars, everything here. So and you actually when you say studio, do you actually have like a recording console and that kind of stuff that you Yeah. For these for the big, the large room studio, this this one doesn't. This is all out of the box and stuff. But I you know, I have Poltex and Neves and you know, just all, all the good that, stuff. All that fun stuff. Yeah. Cause I, I can do everything right. I can actually do everything in this little room that I can do in a big room, with the exception of live drums, obviously. So right. Right. All right. So Super you guys record all your own stuff then at your own studio? Yeah, I've been doing that. Yeah, I've been doing that for a long time since uh, eighty five. That wife had studios since probably eighty two. Uh, but you know, but I recorded at Capitol and MCA Whitney and you know all over the place. Uh, you know, Power Station, all kinds of places. You know, Sunset so, Sound because that's where I Sunset Sound. Yeah, Sunset yeah. in Cherokee. I mean, yeah. All those rooms are great. You know, they're all great rooms. So um, you just got to capture a moment. If you got a good, uh, great environment and you know, the mood is right for you and you're just kind of in sync with what's happening in your world, you you can create that moment that lasts forever. And that's the key to making great records, creating that moment, you know. Yeah. I think and are you still, uh, do you stick to uh, vintage recording types of, you know, tape and stuff? Or are you okay with uh, digital and Pro Tools and, and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I'm I'm Pro Tools. I use Logic sometimes as well. Um, 
I have a lot of digital rinsing going on through analog systems, you know, taking audio out of the digital world, put feeding it through analog, sending it back. Um, so I'm conscious of that. I, I do. I, I like I like the idea of making records with big tone and not overproducing, not do too many parts in records, you know, not too many things going on. And the parts that you have, make sure that they're big and recorded properly, you know, properly and they have their size and weight to them. Mm -hmm. So I'm conscious of, of that. Uh, my vocal chain is, uh, I love, and I've always used this chain. So it's, it's, it's great. It's a 67, uh, a tube 67 uh, through a Neve and a Poltec that I keep off. Just let the tubes run it. So more uh -huh. tubes, I try to throw as many tubes as I can on a thing sure. you know, going into it. So and it works really well. So yeah, compressors after that too, or? Uh, n no, not really. No? I don't like too much. I have 11, 1176 LA 2A that I just like to hit it just a little bit. Um, I don't usually like to put on too much compression. I, I don't because you do so much in processing afterwards. I, I kind of don't want to squeeze, squeeze. And if the mic blows up a little bit, like, you know, little Richard used to do it is, you know, it hits the, it, so be it. You a little distortion on a mic is good sound. So. Right, right. Well, I love this whole philosophy. It's, it's definitely a philosophy that I like to hear. <laughs> because well, uh you know it's so it's so done so little these days you know it's a very old school philosophy that that's a really solid philosophy well the Get, thing capture the moment capture the part capture the yeah. thing record it big and mm -hmm. it's there it's the well the problem the, the big problem that i see a lot of people have and, and i i fall into the trap as well is you know pro tools is a safety net um, I always worked on the buddy system uh, when I recorded uh, live tracks with uh, Patricia and, and uh, Rick Springfield and Kenny Loggins, all these people that I that I did records for, is that I like the drums and guitar to go down at the same time. And mm. that's a buddy system. Mm. If I screw up, we do it again. If the drummer screws up, we do it again. I'm in the room. He's in the room. Together, we create that sound. And I don't usually like to have bass going on at the same time. Because I, I, I love bass, and a bass is like the giant glue monster. You know, if you can get a track that's swinging with, with guitar and drums, once you add that bass, that glue, it just it just makes it all come alive, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then when you just do drums and guitar, you can really work inside the rhythm. And um, because I play drums, and I love, I love everything that I... Mm, Recording to me is trying to create this this beautiful rhythm of things. And I play guitar like a drummer, mm. uh, inside stuff. That's how I think of it, rhythm inside, all these little inside moves. So anyway, that's what I like to do. So That's, that's great. Cool. Yeah. yeah, and when it comes to recording guitar, are you <laughs> – um, how do you, how do you do it? And is it multiple – do you do multiple tracks, left, right, center kind of thing? Or are you just, what's, what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, I, I – I've been left and right for a long, long time. Um, when I joined Derringer um, in at the end of 77, 1977, uh, he had this great rack and it was left and right. And it was like, wow, this is amazing. I, I had an SG, I had one guitar my name, to my name. I had an SG and I can't remember what I had, maybe a little Fender amp or something. I hardly had any gear. So when I joined the band, he goes, well, first of all, we got to get you another guitar and we got to get you some Marshall. So I said, Oh, well, that sounds like a good idea. So I said, let me try your rig. So I played through his rig and I went, wow, this is amazing. But I, he got back on and started playing. I said, "Why? Well, I, I don't sound like you. I want to sound like you. I wasn't even close to sound like him, but that started the, the left and right. And I'll tell you some guy, are you, do you know, uh, Kenny Schaefer from Schaefer Vega? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, and we know of him. Yeah. He, yeah. Oh, great guy. Uh, the wireless systems, right? Yeah, he was one of the beginnings uh, of the wireless systems for guitars and stuff. But he built a rack for Rick and myself. It was the best sounding thing I've ever heard. And I'm not a pedals guy. I don't like a lot of pedals, a lot of anything. I just like a front end, a lot of front end, and maybe a delay. Uh, and that's really about it. But, you know, those wireless, those receivers, mm -hmm. you know which ones I'm talking about, like the yeah. brick? With the mm -hmm. transmitter, yeah. mm -hmm. there's nothing that sounded as good as that. I mean, that was just because it yeah. also had a boost in it, right? It kind of boosted your signal. 
Yeah, you had to do. Uh, we used to do the thing where you play like a C sharp chord, boing, and then you you make the thing usually go to about one o'clock or so. Your transmitter, and then the receiver. If you cranked it up a little more, you had a little more distortion. Um, but it almost played itself. So, but back to the left and right. I do like left and right. I like one side a little bit more distorted than the other. And you know, sometimes I load them up together on one side, or I keep them spread. You know, to, if there's room in the track for it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. It's funny. So, so then you obviously know about the uh, the reissue of the uh, the the uh, Schaefer system. That I don't is around. Now. It, so know. yeah. So there's a there's a guy out there named. Um, oh, I do the, know. Sorry, Solo he's from Dallas. Texas. Is he from uh, Texas? Well, he's Italian originally. Oh. Um, um, from Italy. Uh, Italy wasn't it? Is it Italian? Yeah. And he contacted Ken, and they got together, and you know his whole thing was that was the ACDC sound. I I, I know uh, who you're the, talking of the, about the, the Schaefer yeah. thing, and so they've right. they've did a whole line of different products based around that circuit. They have the little towers that are little re reissues, correct, of it and stuff, and uh, it sounds really cool, especially into like a Marshall and stuff, like uh, your your combos that you use and stuff. Oh, oh my god, it sounds really cool. I think it sounds. I think it sounded pretty close, but it didn't sound close enough to me because I think part of that drive was that transmitter, mm. the transmitter hitting that 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 brick. You know, mm. um, I know he's a he's a big ACDC fan because I, he's Angus. I remember I seen yeah. some of the little ads he does with the thing. Yeah. Um, I still have it. I still have the unit, the no. original. I oh wow, have that's cool. Um, I haven't plugged it in yet, but uh, in a long time, I don't even know. Yeah. If it's but, uh, know, Van, but Han Van, Han Van Halen used it too, right? Yeah, he did. Yeah. Everyone he did. That was, I mean, that was the, I mean, at the time, that was the, the wireless. I mean, that's the, those the first, the, the first professional sort of wireless system that was widely used. And it sounded, it sounded, uh, it played itself. Uh, I think yeah. you know, you just play. And then, you know what I did too? I used when when harmonizer came out. The well, that you know, there's a nine ten, but the nine forty nine came out. And the way Kenny built this rack, he used the 949 as an input gain. And, and that was my front end into the rack. Mm -hmm. So I really didn't have, have to have any kind of distortion or front end preamps or anything. I used the 949 as a preamp. Hmm. And what, into what it kind of amp? Just a regular Marshall? Two Marshalls. I used the little, my little combos, which I love. They're my favorite amps of all time. Now, which combo was it that you have? The um, do you remember? It's, I mean, you told it? me before, but forty four one oh five. I can't remember. It's a hundred watt. Uh, oops, I got to shut my my emails off here. I'll keep making noise. Um, it's the two twelve hundred watt um, master volume. Yeah, I'm trying to seventies. I think they came out in seventy six. I know Jim Marshall. Th uh, said it was a disaster i i um i was doing the us festival and uh i only had i had three and i i thought wow I, i'd like to get more you know because you play you know in front of five hundred thousand people you know maybe it may look a little better too but you know you never know if something blows up it's good to have another one around so i talked to uh, jim and i asked him if 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 he had any and he says it was the, a complete disaster he can have all the all the ones he had left because it they were a terrible design but first of all as you know i use ev speakers in them so one ev is what about 30 pounds by itself so if you load a couple yeah. evs in this thing it, 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 it the whole idea was supposed to you're supposed to take this combo and put it in the trunk of your car that's an impossibility for most people. <laughs> you're, gonna, you're gonna destroy your back. You, you know, as a teenager, you it's not gonna work. So he thought it was a disaster. And I think I took the last remaining five or six that he had. Wow. Yeah. But we just yeah. don't know the name of them. Yeah, they're they're a, you know what? I can find it in a minute, maybe. It's the 41 MK, MK something. something. There's something remember there was something odd about it. Huh. Well, but the, but 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 yeah yeah but you didn't it for a time you used two EVs in it or was it yeah you said you used, yeah two EVs yeah two EVs yeah I remember a million years ago before we actually knew each other one of your techs had brought um me a four by twelve to put EVs in for you uh huh and uh, I remember that I was it's like 
He was like, can I have two more people here, please, to try to lift this? <laughs> I know. that's <laughs> A 4x12 with EVs is just like the most brutal thing ever. But stupid. Yeah, it's it, basically, yeah. It's it sounds a, cool. It's an ignorant cabinet, you know, so, but you it's. Know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, but that's how you that's how you got to get forearms from lifting it that thing. You know, <laughs> your little workout. Um, but they, you know what happened was uh, I got them from Sam Ash in New York. I went to Manny's and I went to Sam Ash, and I have fawn. They were fawn. They were the fawn mm -hmm. color amps, right? And uh, I remember trying the one out in Sam Ash, I'm playing, and boom, it blows up. And I went, oh, geez, that's kind of weird. He goes, well, geez, I don't know. Try another one. So I tried another one and blew that one up. So, but it sounded really, really good. So the guy says, you know what? I'll make you a deal on these things because uh, he's thinking it may be going to be trash, right? So I bought three of them. I did my very first gig with them and I blew two of them up. And Paul Rivera, uh, another excellent uh, amp builder, mm -hmm. was a tech in New York. And he put some, whatever, these little tower caps in there, and then they never blew up again. So I don't know what he did to them, but he did them, and I never had a problem again. Wow. Yeah, well, he's, yeah, Rivera's great, too. Um, I, I, I just been, spent, like, three minutes looking for uh, that amp. I couldn't find anything on it. You can't find anything on it? MK, yeah. maybe JMP, MK something, uh, you yeah. know. I don't pay anything. Uh, hang on a minute. I'll have it in a second. Okay. Right. <laughs> well, let's go back, if you don't mind, Neil, because, sure. uh, you know, I did some reading about your career. I know that you, um, you started guitar quite early in life, right? Yeah. Um, and then sometime, what year did you join Derringer? Uh, right at the end of 77, beginning of 78, 1978. I was, yeah. I think, I just turned 22, I think it was, yeah. Wow. So how did you go from playing guitar starting at like six? Is that when you? Yeah, I started I started six because my father wanted me to do duets with my sister who played accordion and um, and do Italian songs, you know, because, you know, we're an Italian Sicilian household. So, you know, we go to church and we come home from church and then, you know, you get the, uh, the calamari going and you start cooking all this food and the relatives come, friends come over and there I am playing guitar with my sister playing Santa Lucia, come back to Sorrento, you know, this kind of thing. So that was a that was a plan my father had until my uncle Timmy got involved and he was only four years older than me. And, you know, all of a sudden he's he's handing me uh, Yardbirds records and, you know, and, you know, the Stones. And, you know, he just turned me on all the British invasion. My mother was playing Elvis and I was digging the Elvis thing. Uh, and, and I was digging, you know, Sam Phillips, who I who I adore. A funny thing is, is that uh, I, I'm a dedicated musician. And I love to play guitar. I love to play piano. I love to play drums. But when I heard Heartbreak Hotel, I felt like I was walking down that street of loneliness. I felt like I was inside the song. And I loved the idea of that big thumping bass, that great reverb on Elvis's voice and the throw from it mm -hmm. and the guitar, just, uh, just the whole sound of it. And uh, it, it hooked me. And I think I, being such a young person at that age, I, I really felt a connection as a producer. I, I mean, I just, I could hear everything. And I, I liked the placement. And I loved the dimension of what was going on. Mm. So, uh, but I dedicated myself to playing guitar. Then I started playing piano when I was 13 and started studying, uh, you know, all the jazz players and Count Basie and uh, Jimmy Johnson and rock and roll people and Jerry Lee Lewis and, and then, uh, and then uh, I love Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, I love mm -hmm. Paul Simon's writing, uh, and I love the folk thing. I love what they had going on, but there was hardly ever any drums in the records. Right. So I decided, you know, I'm I'm gonna play drums to the records and add my own kind of feel to it. So that's how I started playing drums to to Simon and Garfunkel and stuff. So that's interesting. I like that. Yeah. That's, that's super great. cool. They, that's right. They didn't have any drums. And they were great, great song. And Paul Simon, I mean, when he when he went solo, just some of his song, songwriting was amazing too. And the guitar playing, the you know Cecilia, and just the rhythm, mm -hmm. you know, the rock and rhythm that he had going on. It, it was just so fun to play drums along to that. You know, it was, you create this big sound. You know, so yeah, that's cool. So then, how did you uh, go from 
you know, I guess you started playing in ba local bands and stuff like that. And then how'd you uh -huh. end up hooking up with Derringer? Well, I was, I was playing in, in a bunch of local bands and uh you know the you have the the great wish and hope that it'll be the band you know and then they usually end up breaking up and you know you get depressed and then you look around you find some more people to play with and you do the same thing you step around right and then i decided i i made a choice i i was going to be a cocktail piano player in a bar and i was going to get married have some children i felt like my career was never going to get out of cleveland i was going to be there i might as well keep studying the piano. I love playing all the classic standards. I love all that. So I'm thinking, oh, let me just do that. So some great musicians in the Cleveland area decided to do a band. And it was my last shot at, I felt at doing this band. And the idea was we were going to play lounges and do lounge music, right? And in the daytime, write songs and work out a, you know, your, you know, your rock and roll chops and write those songs, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we never got around to writing the songs. We were playing these lounges, and a guy named Tracy Coates, who owns a PA company, you might have heard of him, David. Um, I don't know which his company. The name sounds was. familiar, yeah. Yeah, he had a big system, but he, he was doing a lot of tours with people, and he says, and I was playing bass, guitar, and I believe keyboards in the band. So I was playing a lot of bass, and, um, and he heard me play, and he says, he goes, you know what? Dan Hartman's looking for a bass player would you be interested in audition for Dan Hartman? I says, well, I'd have to check with my band guys because I don't want to leave them. That ain't right to do. I'll check with them if they think it's okay for me to do it. I says, but I'm a guitar player. That's why I play. He goes, oh, by the way, Rick's, Rick there just looking for a guitar player. He's auditioning guys like crazy. I says, well, can I get that? Can you, can you hook me up with that? He says, yeah. So Dan Hartman was first. Rick Derringer was second. Rick Derringer found out I was going to audition for Dan and he switched to position. So I went to Rick and I never got to Dan. So when <laughs> I auditioned for Rick, it was a funny little story. And, and I outline this much uh, to a greater extent in the book I'm writing, but to shorten it up, he auditioned, I don't know, over 200 guitar players. And, and here I am, I have my SG, I got a pair of jeans, I got a rope belt, I got a pair of white sneakers. And I, and I'm hearing these guys play, coming through the door and i felt like just turning around and walking out I, I mean they were phenomenal players and i'm here and i'm going oh geez i don't have a chance right and they're walking out. i remember this guy rudy valentino his name was and he came out he had the leather jacket his hair was perfect he comes out and he goes how you doing i go good how you doing he goes hey rudy valentino here i go hey neil geraldo hey nice to meet you so i'm scared to death <laughs> so i go in and i play and rick goes oh, yeah yeah Okay, this is I, I like what you're doing here. You got great tone, and you, you know you really have a feel. I says, by the way, I play piano. If I know you have piano on the last record, he goes, yeah, prove it. I says, okay, bring a piano in. Brought a piano in. We did um, uh, Good Golly Miss Molly, and you know some Jerry Lee Lewis things and stuff like that, and uh, and I ended up getting the gig. Uh, so um, it was uh, it changed my life completely because. I went back to Cleveland and I, I was no longer going to be that cocktail piano player anymore and get married to have kids there. Then I was on my way to uh, a career. Right. That's amazing. That's fantastic. And, and, the funny, and the funny thing is when I went to do the record for Rick, I played more piano on it than guitar. So it was just, it was kind of interesting. It was called guitars and women that record. Really? Yeah. So if you ever get a chance to uh, check it out, there's a oh, song wow. called everything on there. That that's uh, that I thought came out pretty well. Todd Rudgren and Rick produced it. That's awesome. I'll definitely check it out. Yeah. Make sure everybody else does in the audience as well. Super cool. Um, so, Dave, did you figure out that amp? That's twenty one oh four. Oh, that so, sounds right. So what? So what? So what it was was it's a um, it's a combo that um, essentially it was the earliest version. They made heads like it too. It Correct. was the earliest version of their master volume circuit. Correct. It was be it was uh, before the twenty two oh three and twenty two oh four, which had a little more gain. Uh, it essentially had a has it took from the original super leads, so is it had it? a uh, there it is it, that's my amp. So it there had it a okay. uh, base channel and a lead channel, uh, very similar to the original super lead amps. 
and then those kind of sum together into the gain circuit and uh, into the gain knob. And then you have uh, your standard EQ for a Marshall and then a master volume. Uh, so it's, it's on the light gain side, um, unless you're cranking it up, of course, then you're going to get more gain from the power section. Um, but just down low, it's probably just slightly crunchy. Probably really similar to um, the the what I call my plexi channel in some of my amps that I do. Correct. The lead channel of that would be very similar to the plexi channel that I have in some of my amps. And they didn't use uh, EL34s. They didn't use those in there. They used the other ones. Uh, 6550? Probably, yes, depending yeah. on... Was yours 100 watt or 50 watt? 100. Okay, yeah. So the 20, the, so while the, okay, this, I'm looking at the 20. Are we sure what it isn't the, just out of curiosity, Joe M Milo asks, are we sure it's not the 4140 Marshall Country no, Club? No, it's oh, not yeah. that. It's definitely okay. not that. Uh uh. No. no. Okay. No, it, it, it's the earliest version of the master volume, and there was a, uh, it, it's listed. It's actually listed, uh, if you search uh, Neil's amps, basically, <laughs> you know, people, people I'm have, uh, they uh, documented it. 2104. That's what it, that's what it was. Sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. That one might be the. What? Oh, sorry. I'm just reading into it as I'm doing. That it. sounds right. That, that number. Yeah, there's, there's a hundred watt version and a 50 watt version. I think they're numbered slightly different. So uh, I could be I, I might not have researched that fully, but uh, that is what it is. Right. Uh, it's, it was you have one channel, one one input that's more bassier if you plugged into it, and the other input that's more brighter. One was just a little lower gain. I don't think it was bassier. It was just lower gain, and I never used that. I always went to the high gain one, the brighter, higher gain one. Of yeah, course. and I always I always kept the same numbers. I part of the way I play is I don't like heavy distortion. I have a hard time playing with heavy distortion. I, I like to be able to articulate every note, and I don't really play bar chords, so I don't I don't really get uh, a lot of the all those uh, uh, harmonics and things coming from every string. I, pl I play mostly three note chords, four note chords. I always mm -hmm. did. Oh. Um, I always wrap my thumb around because Johnny Guitar Watson told me I have to, and uh, <laughs> and I listen to him. He told me two things. He goes, I says, I says. Mr. Watson, sir, what is I, I was 17 when I met him. I said, uh, excuse me, what does it take to become a successful musician and guitar player? He says, well, son, you got to wrap that thumb all the way around to get to all the way around it like this. I go, okay. He goes, and you got to get one of these. And he had JGW and diamonds on a ring. <laughs> so <laughs> he said, if you could do those two things, you can be successful. <laughs> I never got it, so I'm still working. <laughs> I thought you maybe you had it on the side. You put it in. The oh, no. I'm still trying. Uh, yeah, I'll never be the master. I'll just keep trying to attain for that and never reach it. So, um, But I don't like this heavy distortion. I, I like the, there's a certain amount of cleanliness that I, I have to have. I can't play when it's too distorted for some reason. Yeah. Accor according to uh, Premier Guitar, it's the 2104 combos. That sounds about right. I think that sounds right. Um, I look at your rig rundown right here. <laughs> that's it, then. That's it. That's cool. Uh, so yeah, it looks like you also use some later on. We're using some JCM nine hundreds or something. Yeah, I went to the yeah I went to the nine hundreds, and I don't even know the reason why. I think I was doing nine hundreds into the two the, the two twelve uh, combo cabinet. Right. Um. Are you back yeah. to the combos? Yeah, I went back to the combos. I, 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 for some reason, I mean, there's a lot of guitar players that come to the, the gigs and they say, you're the only guy I know that can be able to use 900s and not have them sound fizzly or something. And I I, I don't know. I didn't use the distorted uh, channel so much. I used the cleaner side. So I, I don't know. I don't know. But I don't use them anymore. Well, you don't use – yeah, but, but you don't use that much gain, you were saying. So it's, it's uh, you know, that's – part of volume mm -hmm. and uh just running it cleaner it's gonna sound right bigger yeah. ballsier and better mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> you know that's that's i mean that's the that's the truth of it it's like sure, sure. You said jimmy page doesn't use a lot of gain it's it's mm -hmm. it's big and bold and loud sure, sure. you know well so, you know what uh, it's um 
the, the, I have a problem, you know, my drummer, Myra Grombacher, who's one of the greatest drummers in the world, he would tell me when we would be doing gigs, he'd get done off the gig and he'd be all worked up and he'd say, why, why do you listen to everybody else? Why can't you just listen to yourself and play? You always listen to somebody else. I go, because I'm a record producer. I listen to other people. I don't always listen to myself. But here's another thing. I don't like hearing myself on stage. I always turn the cabinets backwards. You may see a cabinet facing forwards, but I'm not using that. I'm uh -huh. using the one that faces backwards. I can't hear myself that loud. I, I just can't. It mm. makes me nuts. I can't. That's interesting. Yeah. You'd rather be lower in the mix. Yeah, I'd rather have it turn around backwards so I don't hear the direct sound coming at me. Right. I want it to come from another source. And I actually like the idea of a mic'd speaker going through a wedge or a side fill better than I do coming out of the amp. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why. Yeah. Gotcha. Whatever works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> One of my quirkinesses. Yeah. That that's that's the that's the, the most important thing. I mean in building rigs and things for people over the years, it's like I've learned that it's it's whatever works for you is what's right. There is no right or wrong. Whatever's mm -hmm. right for you is right. Exactly. I mean, I tried. I, 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 Who it's knows? hard. Yeah. It's hard for me to hear myself that loud. I just uh, drives me nuts. Yeah. Well, that's yep. cool. Um. So then, after Derringer, so then yep. I, I I remember hearing about you doing studio work. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the famous stuff that you did with uh, Rick Springfield mm -hmm. uh, at Sunset Sound. So how did you start doing some of that work? Uh, well, <clears throat> Rick Springfield came because I was working with Keith Olsen uh, quite a bit. And uh, and Rick says, you know, uh, I mean, uh, Keith said, you know, I'm going to be doing a couple songs with Rick. Uh, maybe you want to get in this and work together. We can produce a couple songs for them. And, and uh, you play guitars, do what you do and produce these things with me and we'll do it. So Rick had a couple songs. I had a song called uh, I've Done Everything For You, You've Done Nothing For Me by Sammy Hagar. And I had that song all the way back when I was with Rick. And um, and I brought it to I brought it to Rick Springfield. Keith, at the same time, brought it to him, too. And I says, why don't we do that song? And let me work on Jesse's girl for you because it it was it was too stiff. His demo he had a great song there, but it was too stiff. He didn't really have a, a middle eight, a bridge wasn't going anywhere. Um, it just didn't have a swing to it. So um, I just made it swing a little bit more, and that's then that's how we grabbed that one um, to make that work out. But um, and then it was just. Um, it's, you know, there was no internet back there. So it was all word of mouth. You know, I'm walking down the street. I run into Stephen Bishop. Stephen Bishop says, hey, why don't you come in the studio? Let's work on, let's do a couple songs. Okay, I go in the studio, work with Steve Bishop for a while. You know, Kenny Loggins calls me up and says, hey, Kenny, you know, Neil, come on. Why don't we do some stuff? You know, let's let's record. You know, just, just bounced around. Right, just being at the right place, right time. Just bouncing around, you know, and, and uh, you know, just doing what I do, so. And were you using those combos even back then on those types of recordings? Oh yeah, yeah. I always used I always used the combos uh, for for everything. I I just used the, the my standard thing and I took it everywhere I went. And that was just Marshall combo with uh, I, when I was dragging the rack around. I was doing that, but when I wasn't doing that, I was just doing a little um, um, preamp and a delay, and that was it. So, wow, that's cool. Well, those are legendary solos legendary guitar work in my well, opinion thank you. No, thank absolutely. You. yeah thank you. I, I mean just i was talking about it with my cousin randy who's a huge fan of yours as well i'm going to mention mm -hmm. his name um but we were talking last night and we were just saying how your you, you don't have extra notes you know mm -hmm. your your writing is perfect for the song you know it fits it perfectly and no excess like everything is there for a reason Correct. Well, here's here's the here's the the concept that I that I use for this. You, in order to make successful records, you got to stay away from, you stay out of the way of the vocal. People are listening to the vocal. Musicians are listening to the instruments, right? And people that don't know what goes on in making records, and I I, I do seminars and I talk a lot of to young people and I tell them a lot of things about placement and things. 
if you're a guitar player and you're coming into a session, there's all kinds of great parts you could play. There's You could do all kinds of great stuff. And if you're a fast player, you could speed around and do all kinds of stuff. But the question is, is it right for the song? Mm. It, it, that's the most important thing. And there's a, a reverb on a snare drum or there's a little chicka part that's somewhere in this track. If you take that out, you lose the feel of the song. So you're always conscious of all those little parts because they mean a lot. Mm. They're very important, right? So, and for solos, um, I always wanted a solo to be an extension of the vocal and a conversation. And I didn't want it to, I didn't want to pull attention to me. Never wanted to do that. I wanted it to be an extension of the vocal. So a person wouldn't get bored. You know, so maybe they can remember, hum the, the melody a little bit, and then I knew what I was going to play when I started the solo, the beginning of the solo, and what I was going to do at the end. But I never knew what was going to go on in the middle, ever. I would just say, hit record, here I go. And right. That's how the solos happened. Um, that's amazing. And just um, the rhythm thing, again, it's, it's all about, uh, it's all about thinking of yourself as a drummer. Now, I did this, this, that band, the Bees in Japan, very huge band, right? Yeah. So the singer was doing a solo record, and Denny Fonheiser, the drummer, exceptional drummer, was re producing a couple tracks. So he says, you know, could you come in and play a, a couple songs? And I says, yeah, sure, I'll go in there. So I played a couple songs, and and he goes, yeah, great, thanks. I, that's great. I, you know, I'm sure it's going to work out great. So then he calls me like three days later, and he goes, do you realize what you were playing? I says, what are you talking about? He goes, I soloed your track and it was like, it was like all kinds of different rhythms going on all the time, all over the place. And I go, yeah. He goes, I've never heard anybody play like that. Cause I'm listening to the drummer right, and I'm right. just trying to get inside him. And I want the vocal to be in the center and I want to be on the edges and hang around with the drummer, you know? That's, yeah, that's great. Well, I love your playing. So. That's That's, that sort of reminds me of when you hear like Pete Townsend or something play too. Exactly. So he's playing, he's, he's playing uh, not the same part over and over again. There's all sorts of accents. There's all sorts of things going on. And, and it's not just the verse here is the verse there. No, it's totally different. <laughs> totally different. Well, look, know, who, totally look different. who he's playing with too. He's playing with yeah. Keith Moon and yeah. in Myron, I call him Tyrone because he made fun of me when I called him Myron. Um, he's like he's like a Keith Moon too. I mean, he would always be all over the place. So so you kind of you work inside. And by the way, Pete Townsend is one of the biggest inspirational people as a musician for me because he was a great songwriter. He is a great songwriter and a great player. And he plays yeah. chords. And yeah. he plays three no chords, substitute and all that. Hold on one second. I got to change my air conditioning. Hold on one second. <laughs> But go, yeah, well, what you like we were saying, Dave, like he just does like a lot of these little stabs or these little pokes and stabs and, yeah. and interesting um, um, flares to the, you know, like um, it's hard to put into words, but yeah. it is, but it's, it's not this linear, like same rhythm over and over again. It's like very just well, the same way with John Bonham too and Led Zeppelin. John Bonham is a drummer never his rhythm was his, his his drumming was full of accents and parts throughout the song it was an ever moving mm -hmm. uh body and 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 you know when you listen to that it's like you listen carefully at the beats it's they're not the same they're not repetitive not they're, at all it's like a moving it's a moving target you know <laughs> it's yeah. It's, it's true. It, it is. It, yeah. it, he's playing it musically, what he was feeling at the time, and adding accents to the, the the thing. There's very few people in the world that can do that kind of thing. Yeah, I, it's great it that really you picked is, up on it. Is. That's that that is true. I got to tell you something funny too. When I did, um, again, the book I write is much more in detail on a lot of these subjects. But when I did Love Is Battlefield, I had uh, I just got a Lindrum. It, it, it was like the first day I had it, so I'm just messing around with the, the little buttons and I didn't realize I had an eight bar phrase I went and I thought it was pretty cool and I accidentally hit the record button and it cut two 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 beats off it so instead of it being an eight, eight, eight bar phrase or something it is a six six bar phrase so what happened when you run a six bar phrase in an eight bar pattern the kick drum never lands at the same spot because it reverses 
right? So, so when I did it and I had this whole program and I, I told Myron, I says, I just want you to play top kid. I want you to play hi hat and snare. And I want the kick drum and the toms and all the other activity going on to be static. I, I want you static and I want everything else around you. He goes, can't do it. Kick drum patterns moving all over the place. I go, I know. I know. <laughs> I said, but it feels right. He goes, you can't do that. It's wrong. I go, I'm sorry. I'm not changing. Yeah, now, now I have to go back and listen to that song. <laughs> listen to the kick drum. Listen to the kick drum part. Changes all all throughout the song. Oh, but man. he does it anyway. He when he plays live, he does he does kick drums all different places too. He's tremendous. So yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah, I so remember. I so remember all those. Um well, okay. So anyway, we're let's 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 not go into there. So so after Derringer and after you're doing these sessions and stuff. So how did Pat Benatar come into being? So what happened with that? I was I was finishing up the record with Rick, and um, there was a couple of projects that were presented to me, and um, record company called and says, you know, we just signed this girl to a record deal, and they uh, were looking for somebody like you, and we heard you'd be perfect because you're, you know, a songwriter, you play multiple instruments, you're, you know, you're song uh, structure is, is important to you. You're not just a, you know, a dweedler, you know, that's not what you do. Right. So would you be interested in meeting this person? I says, uh, sure. I says, but if, but I says, I'm going to Cleveland, I'm going home. I just finished the record with Rick. I'm going home now for a little while and come back to New York. He says, well, listen, if it doesn't work out, I'll get you a ticket the next day back to Cleveland. But if it works out, I'm not going to let you leave. I'll put you in a hotel and then you can put the band together and do everything you need to do. Right. So I went there and I, I met Patricia and uh, I sat down at the piano. I started playing some stuff there. I says, what is it that you're going for? She says, I want a band. You know, I want a, I want a real band. Uh, I want, I want the, you know, the Mick and Keith and, you know, Jimmy Page, Robert Plant. He, I want that kind of activity going on, but she, she didn't come from a rock and roll background. This is the thing that you got to understand. It was all theater and uh, show tunes and cabaret. It was not a rock thing at all. Meanwhile, I saw, I was immersed in all the blues and rock and that's all I did. You know, I was, you know, but I did jazz too. And I, I loved, you know, Bill Evans and, you know, forget about that piano stuff. I go deep on that. I love that. But, but, but that's what, you know, she was talking. I says, well, that's great. So you mean you want to put a band together? <laughs> and she says, yeah. So we got along great. Uh, the record company guy says, well, you guys are getting along great. Here you go. It's all yours. So then I went and picked out a drummer, got another guitar player because he had cool looking hair, uh, bass player. And, and then uh, we started working on songs and the rest is history. Yeah. Oh, did we lose Mark? Oh, you guys, can you hear me yeah, now? Now we got I you. Can, you know. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I did something. I muted myself, and then didn't want to make noise when you were talking. Yeah. <sighs> sorry. Problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those days. Technical difficulties. Yeah. The whole world is full of these right now. Yeah. <laughs> Every day there's technical difficulties on people zooming and everything else online. Everywhere uh, in the uh, world. Yeah. yeah. Brutal. So brutal. I mean, you know, I can only imagine how many. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um no problem. So yeah, so that's that's fantastic about what was a perfect it was a perfect it was a perfect moment because I really wanted to start something brand new. Uh, I love playing with Rick and it was an honor to play with him. To me, he's one of the greatest guitar players in the world. And I thank him every day for, for having me join that band without joining that band. I would have never been anywhere. I would have never gone anywhere. I learned so much from him, good and bad. I learned bad stuff too. And I learned most of it was good. I learned that you can't really suck when you're playing and you have to make sure you play your ass off every time you pick up the instrument. Right. Like the first gig I did with him after the show, he came back to me and goes, what are you doing? You sounded like shit. I, I hired you because you're a great <laughs> player. You sounded awful. I says, Rick, I was just playing in front of 150 people about two weeks ago. Now I'm playing in front of thousands. Give me a day. And I never did it again. Never yeah. did it. I made sure. I yeah. had to be yeah. right yeah. on it, right? But it was a perfect opportunity because all I was looking for, all I wanted 
was a great singer. If I can get a great singer and I can write songs and create this sound and start from something from the very beginning, that's all I wanted. I didn't realize it would be a female, but it didn't matter to me. I, I really didn't care. I just wanted a great singer. And I was going to ask you, did, was it a, did you have any trepidation of, you know, having a band with a female lead singer? Not and at all. At a, at a time at that, you know, when it was all dominated by male. Yeah. Dominated not rock. at all. I never yeah. thought, I never thought twice about it. Never. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't care. And, and I, and I'd fight for anybody that would, would, you know, say anything bad or, or do anything disrespectful. You know, I have a lot of Sicilian roots in me. I'm not a violent guy, and I'm not an angry guy, and I'm not a tough guy. I'm but the you're biggest passionate. But I'm the biggest wimp you're going to find. But I got to tell you, don't get me there because I can put a hand through concrete if I need to. So I, you know, I I was there to protect, and I did, yeah. and I was happy to do that. You know, um, I'm sure she but, appreciated that too. So. Yeah, 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 she did. Everybody around all kind of worked together, and we worked as a team. We were we were more of a band than most bands. That's right. why it's it's always funny when people think of it as a certain thing. It was really never, it's never, never was that. So, but, but did it feel like for you guys that it took off really fast with, mm -hmm. with hits? Oh, yeah. um, Big fast, or, right? Because right? it wasn't like you were when when in you know were struggling for a while with Pat. Right. Well, right? well, here's what happened. What happened was Mike Chapman was was hired to produce the record. Mike Chapman produced Rick Derringer's record before the one I did. So he, Mike Chapman saw me play with Rick live doing live shows. Right. So then follow me through on this. So Mike Chapman heard a Patricia sing at a club, a, a comedy club. And he of course thought she sounded great, but didn't understand the band. There was, it was just didn't make any sense to him. And he says, that's when he says, I got the perfect guy for you. He's young. He does his song structured guy. You know, he plays a lot of instruments. This is the perfect guy for you. So that's how that led to that. Right. But here's the thing. Mike produced four songs off the record and none of them are hits. And Pete Coleman and myself, we did the other songs and, and, and they kept, they kept releasing the ones that Mike produced and they were getting so frustrated because nothing was hitting. So then they decided, well, let's try Heartbreaker. Uh, but you remember it was heavy disco at that time and people wouldn't play it because they thought there was too much guitar on the record. Right. And then a Seattle in Portland up in the Northwest decided to, to play it around the clock. And that's how it started. And uh, then it became a hit. And that's how we, that's how we really, we were, we were close to like, well, what are you going to do next? We keep releasing these songs and nothing goes. So, but that one did. And that was the beginning. That was it. Yeah. And then MTV. Mm -hmm. and yeah, MTV. Someone someone posted here in the chat. Uh, Neil was the first guitar. I, I'm sorry, I can't find it right now. But yeah. uh, Neil was the first guitar player on MTV. Well, so, yeah, and, and Scott was in the MTV. band as well. He played guitar too. Um, yes. Well, what what happened was. It was Video Killed the Radio Star was the first song, and there was no guitar player in the band. So right. that then I we were next with You Better Run, and there's the guitar, and it but I just remember it being 16 hours long, and I had this beautiful my hair was fantastic. I had James Dean going, I was looking all real good, <laughs> everything was fine. By the time the take happened, uh, it, it all came down. <laughs> I just, just totally destroyed my look. It was and nobody cared about anybody else in the band, you know. So. Right, right, right. That's so, funny. Yeah. And we always played. We always played live mm. for the videos. If there was a performance video, we played live. Yeah. We used the track, but we were actually playing. So right. So yeah. Make it look convincing. Yeah, uh, we'd like to play anyway, so we would do it. So so I want to get back to this conversation, but we also had a super chat from yes. Vincent. Yes. Vincent Moretti. Mark and Dave. We'll miss you this year. Uh, yeah, from Nam. Miss you too, buddy. Uh, Neil, can you talk about how the business of music has changed and how a musician who worked with another musician got paid, where royalties shared? How did it work back then? Hmm. Okay. Well, the way it worked back then was not so good. Um, 
uh, hmm. the only thing that was good about it is when records were sold, there was a, you know, there was an income stream from records being sold. But I give you an example. Uh, when I wrote the song "We Live for Love," which was the second single off the first record, "In the Heat of the Night," I met with the publishing company, and they said they would give me five hundred dollars, I believe it was, for the song. Five hundred dollars for the song, <laughs> and and I can keep some of the publishing, but five hundred dollars. And I, I had the meeting with him, and I scratched my head, and I'm thinking, five hundred dollars is that all you get for a song? I said, well, this doesn't make any sense. Well, he says, you'll never get another, you'll never write another song. Nothing will ever happen. I go, I think let me work on this a little bit. Well, next thing I knew, I got a, a deal for 10 grand and, uh, and advanced money and everything else. So, so the idea of, of, of sharing in things, you know, here's the problem with the music business. When you're a musician, you only care about making music, right? That's all you care about. You're gonna go in a studio, you wanna be successful, you wanna be on stage, you wanna play for thousands, you wanna make records, right? But there's a reason they use the word business at the end of the music business, because there's a business part of music that you need to understand. I didn't understand in the beginning and I got taken advantage of a lot because I, was only interested in making music. You know, the, you know, the Harry Truman that says you'd be surprised what you can accomplish if you don't care about who gets the credit. <laughs> well, that's kind of how I felt. And I thought that way. I just wanted to make great records. I just didn't know about all the other people that they didn't follow that philosophy, you know? So I don't know if that helps answer the question, but um, I think you have more control over your careers now, which I think is tremendous. Your music can be heard anywhere. Um, you know right all right well thanks Vinny. appreciate the question i hope that answers it did that answer his question properly yeah i mean okay i believe um so getting back to and you you call i you see i've always known her uh my whole life as pat benatar so the color mm -hmm. patricia um so i mean but the band just blew up back. Mm -hmm. it really did uh, and i remember i i was you and i were I was reminiscing with you last night, telling you I've grown up with with uh, the music, um, as probably have a lot of our audience. Um, I mean, it was so big. Like I remember, like Fast Times at Ridgemont High, they had people who dressed up like Pat Benatar, you know, in, in the movie. Right. I mean, how how was it for you during that time? You know, being so uh, touring uh, touring the world, and was it overwhelming? Was it? Well, it was. It was moving so fast, and. Uh, you know, the our manager that we had, you know, was a nice guy, but he didn't really understand how you manage a band. So what happened was the record company decided to put the band on a seventh month suspension. In other words, you needed to make a record every nine months or right. else your, your deal would be suspended. You'll So we had to make a record every nine months. Yeah. So that means touring. When the touring was done, oh my God, we got to write songs. We got to get in the studio and, and make another record. We did that. I don't know, seven years, eight years in a row. Yeah, that was that was that was the t that was the thing then. I mean, like you look also. I mean, recently we lost Eddie Van Halen and right. and stuff like that. But if you look at you know, first record was seventy six, and like I call the last great record was nineteen eighty four. But in that course, how many records were released? Oh my God, it was almost like it was every year. Every year, boom, 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 boom. But, but it the was amount of output in the short period of time. You you forget when you look back at it now, you see it. Wow, that's a lot of records in that period of time. Because now yeah. records aren't released like that. It's, it's stuff's mm -hmm. not done that way. You know, it's like people every three years or something. Maybe they might put out product or sure. depends on if they're active or not. Right, but it was too much. It was to me. It was it was too much. We never had a chance to settle. There was yeah. never a chance to settle. Uh, thankfully, uh, because I have a, a uh, oh, I don't know what the, how to explain this is. Um, I get bored quick, and <laughs> so so what would happen is I would make this record, and you know, it, it, if you're talking about details, from the minute we walk through the studio till the time that record's done. I I knew where every second of every note lived 
throughout the whole thing. I was, I was involved in engineering to every part of it. I, I wanted to shape this thing to have a certain sound to it. And I paid a lot of attention to it. And I worked around the clock on this. But after that record was handed in, I would write a song the next day and send it to the record company and say, this is what I'm thinking about next. And they would all go crazy because they hated it. Because why can't you just do the same thing that was successful? So if you listen back to the catalog of songs, you'll need, you'll see how different so many of them are. That's because I was I, I did it. I did that record. Well, that's enough. Now I'm going to try doing something different. I did a, a record we called Gravity's Rainbow, and I decided that I wouldn't use a I wouldn't I didn't use a guitar tuner. So we're micro tuning. So if somebody's going to try to play along with it, it's not perfectly in tune. So right. I, and I don't know why I did it. I wanted it to be all live, and um, like well, most of them were live anyway. Yeah, that sounds but, good though. Sounds cool. It's fun. I mean, you know, just different. I mean, uh, you know, and then I, after we did that noisy, you know, electric guitars, ah, let's do a whole acoustic record. Let's get a fiddle player. Let's get a uh, viola player in here. Let's do all acoustic. And then I decided to do an acoustic guitar plugged into a Leslie and, uh, you know, different kind of stuff. Just always trying to change it up. You know? Right. Well, I, I always look at that kind of stuff as very old school. I mean, all, all those all the great bands that we know and come to love, you know, like the, the, the who and the, and, and Led Zeppelin and things mm -hmm. like this, they experimented from record to record. They sure experimented did. with their sound. It's like, Hey, you know, you look at Led Zeppelin and you look at, you know, presence or, or different records and you know, it's, it's different. Some are more acoustic based. Some are yeah, not. I mean, some you are compare different. Zeppelin one to Zeppelin three is so different. Yeah. 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 And I noticed that too. And yeah. I love that. Right. And I think that's cool, but you know, the business of music. Oh yeah, the 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 label wants the same thing. Let repeat, rinse and repeat again, yep. rinse and repeat again. But the but the fact of the matter is 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 at least I remember as a kid listening to these things. I wanted to hear what they were doing next. I wanted to hear the experimentation that they were trying to do and and what it was. Maybe I didn't like it. Maybe 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 I did like it, but. I enjoyed the fact that it was different because mm -hmm. if you make the same record over and over and over again, after a while you're bored. Yeah. It's like, I, I don't even care to hear this anymore. I mean, of course. And, and see, I noticed that too. I noticed Led Zeppelin three was, was more acoustic and yeah. I love that. Me too. I loved when ZZ top did Tejas, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it was all DI guitar. There's like plugged into the board. I, I yeah. mean, I, I thought that was great. You know, it, it, the thing is, is that I, I think that, and this is the reason I love Jack White so much is, is that you, you have to be, you have to be brave and you have to be disruptive if you want to have a career. Yeah, excellent. You know, it's very, it's very important. I can't tell you how many songs I handed into the record company that they refused to release and they ended up being big hits. <laughs> I can just if you, if you know what they are, they were they were refused. They they yeah. wouldn't do it. They says you need to do it again. You have to re-record this. I it's what are you thinking about? I says I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not. So and and you you have to take chances and you have to be disruptive in a positive way and you have to be brave and not be afraid. You cannot have fear. And the thing with Pro Tools, the thing that's you shouldn't be looking at music. You should be hearing music. You should shut that screen down. Don't watch the little colors and don't watch the little things. Close that screen down. Listen to what you're doing and and entrust your instinct and, and forget about the net, the safety net. R record like you have no safety net. Yeah. You know, that's how yeah. I, I still feel. You know? I, I, that's a great philosophy, and I, I totally agree with everything on that. You know, I, I totally, and I also love Jack White, but um, because he does that, he experiments, he All the does time. different bands, he does different things, and, mm -hmm. and it's like, who says I can't put this one string guitar through a fuzz pedal into a, <laughs> yeah, whatever <laughs> in, you want to do, an accordion amp, you know, of course, of course. I'm just making it up, but yeah, um. Uh, yeah, he he's a brilliant artist, and and I think um, I don't know if he gets enough credit actually for that. 
Yeah, I don't know. I I just I remember, you know, I I I just I love because he's he just I love everything he, he the way he structures his musical world and and one of my one of the things I thought was super great was Ted Nugent wrote a a thing about him and says you know he should really practice more because he sounds bad or whatever like this so instead of instead of Jack White burying that review he puts it on the front of his website because yeah. because he, <laughs> he makes a mockery. Of of that comment. Uh-huh. Now that's a real ballsy thing to do. I, yeah, he's got I, balls. He yeah, he's got balls. balls. You, you gotta love the guy. You know. You know I mean? I'm, a, I'm originally from Detroit, and um, well, there you go. <laughs> yeah, so I appreciate that. But you know, I also appreciate the fact that you know he has he has his uh, record pressing plant and everything. And I w- I went to actually tour it when I was there uh, not too long ago, uh-huh. and 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 to see the operation that he's made, and to do this pressing plant and to do this in such a unique way with a great mastering engineers there. And, and it's cool. It's great. He's giving back with that. You know, he's, he's giving that. back because, yes, he is. you know, you can get, you know, you're, if you're a, a small band or something, you can get your stuff, you know, printed. If you're a large band, you can just stuff printed. If you want purple vinyl, you can have purple vinyl. If you want Correct. weird stuff, you can have it, but, but he's really put a lot of time and a lot of money. He did he well. He he's, making this. he did a great job of of creating that business. Remember, I, we were talking about music business. Yeah, he actually is super creative and able to walk, take a step back, and and be a businessman too. I mean, that's you know that's that's really hard. That's really difficult to do, and he's done it. You know, speak. Yeah. You spoke of the give back. I have to mention this because I have a spirits company. It's called uh, Steel Bending Spirits. And we have a a bunch of products, of SKUs. We got three quart bourbon. We have a rye. We got a Pinot barrel uh, bourbon as well. Quite a bit. But we started a music ambassadorship program. Uh, when COVID hit, we were doing tip jars for players so they can go online and play. Uh, we would when before COVID, we were doing. Um, uh, paying for the band to go play places, you know, paying their salary because the band, the, the clubs wouldn't allow them to do it. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I'm available to anyone. If they have a question, I can answer a question. I can help them if they have a song that they're working on is, you know, so there's a, a, a give back program to it. And I said from the day one that we started and it was May, 2016, I didn't want to wait for the company to be largely successful to give back. I wanted from, from day one. Mm-hmm. So if there's a dollar coming in, I want to give back a portion of that dollar. We I have a great team, everybody, and I te- I I that's fantastic. I use this I use this business as a band, and I tell everybody, stay in your own lane, do what you do best, and we create this sound all together. And and I got a phenomenal team. I got such great people, hardworking foot soldiers that are just the greatest. They work so hard. They believe in the messaging. And uh, they're just a great bunch of people. So if you if you want to read more, learn all about it, go to threechordbourbon dot com. Threechordbourbon dot com. Yeah. yeah, it's funny. I I've actually had that bourbon. Oh, you did. And oh. and 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 I did not realize that that was your company. So uh, it's uh, well, there I am. It's uh, <laughs> you know looking down. That that's super cool. I mean, you know, it it it. Um, very cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I it's like it's, it's creative. It's you know, but but doing doing the liquor and stuff, it's it can be very creative and a cool business and a cool rock and roll style business. And yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's cool. It's, it's well, here's the other thing I'm gonna do. I try to engage in conversation. Now, you know, I know Sammy Hager, he's a great guy. And, and then there's nothing wrong with drinking tequila, and there's nothing wrong with jumping on tables, there's nothing wrong with that party yeah. atmosphere, yeah. nothing wrong at all. It's mm-hmm. I wanted to create a, a platform for conversation. I go to too many restaurants when you used to be able to go to restaurants, yeah. too many restaurants where everybody there is on their phone. Nobody's mm-hmm. talking. There's no conversation. Yeah. I want to yeah. sip. I want to respect the moment mm-hmm. and I want to create that conversation. Yes. Yeah, so that's, that's sort of uh, that's a, and that's a very European or very Italian upbringing kind of. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I have a grappa coming too. speaking of that. My my grandpa Nunzio, when I was five years old, he would put me on my knee and he would he'd have me he'd have wine and whiskey and 
<laughs> grappa. So I have a, a, a grappa come, coming called Nunzio's Basement. His name was Nunzio. <laughs> so Nunzio's Basement Grappa. So, so, like, so basically you're saying you – Unlike many people that have been in this business for a long time, have have not had issues with liquor. No, I did have issues with liquor. Oh yeah, <laughs> but I, I had some issues. But but uh, I put those aside a long, long, long time ago. And in moderation, uh, I don't encourage uh, drinking. I don't cur encourage it at all. I believe everything in moderation is is proper. And uh, and and again, if it's about conversation, if it's about enjoying the moment yeah, respecting yeah. people it, it's just about you know you know kindness there's, there's is not better than, yeah there's nothing better than sitting around and and talking yeah you know and, and, and turning your phones yeah. off and having just sipping something and and you know i i, I love that philosophy because that, that's that's great if you can do that yeah i i, I mean i'm not encouraging that i i i'm not i i really want to create this 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 atmosphere now i have you see this drum head back here whoa yeah right. record bourbon this is the whiskey drummer um i had i i can't believe i got that name a trademark so what i'm doing with whiskey drummer i'm getting all of my favorite drummers and all the great drummers i have them autograph it and then i'm going to auction it off 100 percent, 100 percent to charity and i hope to get all the great drummers and i have a bunch of these heads that i thank my guitar czar rob cunningham because rob was the one that told me i should do your show i didn't yeah I didn't, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he's my known, guitar czar i've known so, rob for years uh, uh -huh. i remember doing stuff for him like 20 years ago you know he's a great like, guy every so often he pops up on the radar and and yeah and he said yeah you want do you want neil on the show and i go well yes of course I do. <laughs> Why not? Uh, you know, I I think I still have your number. I probably could have. I you probably, probably reached out yourself, uh, you myself. But um, uh, you know, sometimes I just don't think. You know, the funny thing about the show is like me booking people. It's like sometimes I just like don't think. Like, oh yeah, we could do. Oh yeah, that person. That's a good idea. Yeah, let's of try course. to get in touch with them. Um, you know, that would be a good idea. You know, this show was started as just shoot the shit. It's it's exactly sure. what you're sort of talking about, having conversation, but having it online. And sometimes we have a drink while we're doing it, you know, or whatever. Yeah. And uh, and occasionally that went out, that kind of went off the rails. But <laughs> right, <laughs> it could get bad. Yeah, it, 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 you know. Yeah. But you know, those are beloved shows. Although sure. it, it's a train wreck to me, I can't look at it now. But <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, um, but yeah. That's good. But yeah, it's the same thing. It's a shoot the shit show, and we yeah. talk about wherever it takes us. Of course, which I like because, especially with a, a guest like yourself, that is um, talkative and can speak about his career and 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 his life, uh, it makes it so easy. You well, know? you guys do. I mean, it just, just flows. Like it flows. You talk yeah. in conversation. Listen, we're talking about drums. Yeah, right? that's kind of crazy. There's a bunch of guitars in the background. I got drum heads. I got ukuleles, lap steels. I got, sticks. <laughs> I got all kinds of stuff going on. Yeah, but, but I'm excited about the drum head because they he did a great job. Check this. Yeah, thing it looks out. great. Yeah, it does look good. You know, Rob is tremendous. So he yeah. had Evans do. You know, the heads with the you know the old capskin style heads. Right. Um, yeah. And then um, that's a little logo. This is yeah, three that's excellent. right there. Yeah. So you get all these great drummers to sign it. I got quite a few of these heads. So I'm 100 percent to the to the charity. 100 percent volunteer driven nonprofits it goes to. That's great. Yeah, right. That's great. And I'm Ooh. sure you, you know plenty of drummers. I know a lot of drummers. Yeah, yeah. I got <laughs> drummers and guitar players, actually. Yeah. 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 So, uh, we, we've got a few uh, super chats and then uh, I want to sure. go back to a few other things. Uh, oh, Davy C. Music, thank you for the super chat. Uh, how do ideas come to you most? Every artist hears melody, of course, but most often start with a guitar riff, vocal mm -hmm. melody. How mm -hmm. does that come to you? Okay. Never starts with a guitar riff, ever. Um, most melodies and songs that I write are usually on piano, and I don't I don't write on guitar because I'll write a, a, like chord stuff. I'll, I'll do some of that stuff and sing melodies on top of that acoustic guitar, never electric, because I want the song to live on its own uh, in acoustic environment. 
because truthfully, if I if I do and I get to art, next thing you know, I'm going to be playing Lightning Hopkins and blues riffs, and you know, I, I, I'm not gonna I'm gonna play the instrument. I'm not gonna write a song. So ideas are most mostly when I'm on piano, uh, when I'm driving. If I'm driving, I'm always getting ideas. Ideas. The idea is, I believe everybody is a writer and everybody is a creator. The real thing you have to try to to do is to open that conduit. Uh, why am I turning all white? Okay, there I go. Let me back up. Um, the uh, the uh, conduit you have to you have to open that conduit and allow things to come in. And you said something early on in the show. And it's really funny. If you want, if you want to, if you listen to a drum track or, or a take that a band does, you will know immediately when the drummer starts thinking. Because as soon as you think, you're done. You can't think. Mm -hmm. I mean, I studied Kundalini. I studied all kinds of little metaphysical stuff of recording and writing and things like that. I once did a song called uh, Painted Desert. And <clears throat> I went into the room and I had acoustic guitar and I says, okay, go record. And I started playing and I finished it. And I says, okay, I'm ready to do it. Can we do it? I didn't even realize that we were recording. I just got so mesmerized and lost. I didn't even know I did it. So it's a conduit. So the harder you try, the further away it gets. It's like golfing, right. you know, just yeah. same thing. Oh. It's such a hard thing when that red light goes on. A lot of people freeze, including myself. Even just the phone. Even just the phone. Just putting the phone on and do a recording of yourself playing guitar. Uh huh. I'm like, I just played it three seconds ago. Of course. Five times, no problem. I go, I hit that record button, and I'm just like. But I would tell, I would tell all my engineers when I, as soon as I walk through the door and go in that room, I want you to hit record and stay in record. I don't care what anybody says. Stay in record. Because yeah. it's it, it is it's it psychologically screws your head up, but uh, yeah, catch the moment. Yeah, just just the to his question, just don't force it. Mm. You have to step back, and then it and it comes. Yeah, fantastic advice. That's good. Uh, Joe Milo, thanks for the super chat. Sending this in hope that you can let Neil know that his playing has always been an inspiration in his intro part. On La Belle Age is La Belle La Belle Age mm -hmm. is the perfect example in mastery and unique style. Thank you for sharing the goods. Mm. Well, thank, thank you, you, Joe. Yeah, that was uh, that started as um, I, I, what I really was doing was trying to set up the tempo for the drums in the band to play. So as I was just trying to do a rhythm, and I just kept it as as part of the song. I did that with. Um, we used to do that a lot. I did that with Don't Fight It uh, for Kenny Loggins. I I would always start a song and I'd play the tempo, like a syncopated tempo to kind of lock everybody in to what that's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times guys hear that and they end up keeping it. So hmm. That's cool. Uh, we've got another super chat from Music Therapy Lads. Thanks for getting such a great guest. Neil Geraldo, dude, you rock. Thanks for the music you brought us. Thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it. And I agree wholeheartedly. So let's talk guitars. Sure. So what were some of the like guitars that you love, that you still use, that you've used for years? I'm just curious, like, you know, because I've seen you in many different types of axes. Mm -hmm. uh, I use a $99 Framus to, to write songs on an acoustic uh, the strum, you know, that's laying around all the time. If I if I have an idea or something, I'll just strum and play that thing. Uh, for live, I've used tellies a lot. Um, I like them a lot. Um, I like the V-neck of it. It fits my hand really well. Um, my early days, I used BC Rich Eagles, and I like that design a lot. Uh, when I joined Rick's band, he played an Explorer. He says, you got to get a BC Rich. I says, oh, I really like yours. And he goes, you can't get what I have. <laughs> you, have <to> get <laughs> you can't have what I got. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I, I really loved the Eagles. It was a cola and boy, it just, it was just a beautiful, I still have them and they're, they're phenomenal. Um, what am I playing lately? 
Well, I'm trying to think. It's it's been a while since I've been on the road. Let's see. Right. Did you do some Duesenbergs for a while? No. No, no, no. Duesenbergs. No. Um but you like hollow bodies, right? I mean Oh, like I was doing a guild starfire. Yeah, because I like that when they fight back, you know, because they're always on a threshold of feeding back and getting goofy on you. So mm -hmm. you have to control it. So you really have to work at it. Um I do also I was playing with my thumb pick and went away. Um uh, I I use really heavy strings. I don't use heavy strings anymore uh, because my grip and the way I play is very intense, like heavy. I, I don't play soft and my hands aren't really relaxed. They're very tight. Mm -hmm. uh, why am I changing colors here? Okay, there I am again. Um, so uh, I sometimes use a thumb pick and I cut, cut the thumb pick all the way down to the thumb. Mm -hmm. So So I just get a little bit of that pick and I'm able to use all my fingers like that so I can dig in and pull up because I pull up on a string. So uh, anybody listening, if they're using heavy strings and they're young, enjoy that. As you get older, it's going to be an issue. I mean, because I really screwed up my thumb. But I used to use 12s and 13s. I would use the 60, oh, wow. 13 to 60. Oh, that was goodness. insane. It was E flat, but it's still 13 to 60. Yeah. And now your hands just don't. Yeah. Well, can't. my thumb, you won't be able to see yeah. it, but you know, my thumb has got a giant lump on it because oh. I, I abused it for so many years. Cause I can't play soft and easy, you know? Right. So I now we, Oh shit. This is my, I can't do this. That's my granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll wrap it up in uh, just about She's 15 so minutes with you. Sure. So, um, so uh, no, that's great. Yeah. Um, as far as heavy strings, so you're using you're using much lighter strings now. Much lighter, and you know what I'm using now? I'm using uh, Les Pauls because of the shorter scale. Uh -huh. It's easier to bend. So so I'm using more of them. I have a gold top, uh, a couple gold tops here. I love P90s, but they're not always happy with the lighting rigs and on the road. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, right. Well, they sound the best. My favorite pickup, but they're yeah. they're not happy. Should look into uh, Lindy Fralin hum canceling P90s. They're, <laughs> they're super cool sounding. Super. Are great. they cool? They're well. They're as good as it'll get for hum canceling P90. It's okay. it sounds good. It sounds good. okay. I'll check you that know, out because I do very like good pickups. Yeah. yeah. Call Lindy directly and at, at his shop, and he'll. Uh, I'm sure he'll, he'll hook you up. Out. Okay, that'd be cool. You know, it's a funny story. Yeah. Speaking of that, pickups. Uh, Seymour Duncan, when he used to wind them in his garage, you know, and mm -hmm. years and years and years ago, he, uh, I asked him to build me some pickups for my Strat early, early on. So, so he, so he makes these pickups. I get them. They're phenomenal. And, mm -hmm. and the back pickup was sensational. So they're great. So he calls me up and he says, he goes, how do you like the pickups? I said, I love them. They're great. He goes, well, I got some good news and some bad news. I go, Oh no, not good news. Bad news. He goes, well, <laughs> the, the bad news is you got Jeff Beck's pickups and he got yours. I went, Oh no. He goes, the good news. He loves yours. <laughs> you don't want to <laughs> and you love his. <laughs> and I love his. So I didn't return him either. <laughs> so, yeah, it was a good, oh, good That's story. awesome. That's a great story. Was that a rewind? That that uh, or he just built them. He just yeah. built them from scratch. I told him what I wanted, and because I was playing strats, and I I didn't want the heavy, uh, distorted sound. You know, I didn't want it to be a right. You know, like a, a stacked. I I just wanted really nice mid range, and uh, I I have a lot of low end in my hands, so I don't use a lot of low end on my amp ever. Um, in fact, Timmy Pierce who. A great guitar player, really dedicated guitar player too. Uh, I gave him his first studio gig with John Waite when I produced the John Waite record Ignition, and oh, wow. that was his first. That was the first gig he did, studio gig he did, yeah. and he's the guy that told me that the reason I don't use a lot of low end is because I have a lot of low end in my hands. Now, I never realized that. He told me that like whatever thirty years ago or something, but I never never knew that. But that is true. If, you, if people are putting a lot of low end bass on your amp, it's because they don't have a low end a lot of low end in their hands. It's true. People's hands vary wildly. Wildly, mm -hmm. uh, I've always said I, I've had people like I I know something sounds great, and I've had them come in and plug into it, and listen to it, and going, man, did it break? 
Is it broken? <laughs> and and it's just because their hands sound a different way, and it mm -hmm. and it just and it doesn't mesh well with the, you know, like for instance, your your amp. I mean, not everyone can play an amp like that and manhandle it in in a way that will make it sound good, right? Um, some people might come in and plug into your same setup and sound. You're just like what? That's not your sound. I go, yeah, no, that's what I use. <laughs> yeah. it's, well, I'll tell you, know? you what. When I plugged in the Rick's rig, and man, I I listened to him. Oh, you sound amazing. Let me try it. As soon as I played it, I went, oh, <laughs> damn, I don't sound nothing like that. Right, right. <laughs> that seems to be a common story when most most yeah. guitar players they jump on someone else's rig. Um, we've got a, a super chat from yep. Davy C Music. Anything you've ever sold that you have major seller's remorse over? Yeah, I sold I sold uh, one of my Marshall combos, and I don't know why I did that. Um, I don't know why. I, 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 during the early days of touring, um, I would buy guitars, like a guitar, vintage guitar company would call uh, my manager and say, you know, I'm, he's going to be in town. Can we bring stuff by? What does he want? And they'd bring like, 12 strats and a few tellies and I'd pick a few out. But what I did mostly was buy microphones and preamps because mm -hmm. I was always in the studio. So I was buying Fairchild's 67s, 47s, you know, 87s, Neve, Mike Pre's, uh, 3As, 2As, LA, you know, all and these studio, yeah. gear, studio gear. And they were more affordable. Yeah. In fact, they let the guy from Germany laughed at me because I bought a EMT 250 and a Fairchild, and I says, you got any more? He goes, yes, I have one of each more. I go, can I Can I get both of those? He goes, you want them too? Ha, ha, ha. I only paid $800 for the Fairchild. And as you know, they're like $40,000. So, and what well, is that worth now? Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, and I bought $40,000 to tube it, retube yeah. it. So, yeah. um, but, I, but I sold one Marshall combo. I don't know why I did that. I, I don't know. I did, and I, I should have never done that. But most of the stuff, and I had a pink bc rich bitch that was kind of cool i used it in this video precious time and mm -hmm. I, I sold that too and i don't really realize why i even did that so a friend just texted me and said cool story i rocked the 65 fender jazz all over the so socal scene in the late 80s early 90s bought it from norman's rare guitars it was owned by neil Giraldo. yeah that yeah that let's see oh yeah that's a good one yeah that was a good one yeah, so I like that bass. So you own that. That's fun. That's so cool. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a really good one. I, I did. I remember that. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's, it's something about guitars is kind of cool. If if it, if it's no longer speaking to you and for some reason to share it with somebody else, picks it up in their hands and becomes really blessed for them. Mm -hmm. There's something really good about that. You know, there's there's a real good chi, you know. I agree with that. You know what? I don't know if anybody else has experienced this, but on reverb, I've, when I've sold guitars, mm -hmm. you know, like I, I make sure, you know, message the person, tell them, you know, a little bit about the guitar. If I, if I want, I'll do a little video, just show them the, how the guitar sounds or whatever. And then sure. I want to make sure that they're happy with the guitar afterward and that, that they like it. And most of the time people message me back and be like, love the guitar and it makes me feel good you know like i'm like okay i didn't bond with it but at least you like it you know at least you're into it it's you know giving back you know i was saying this before you know thoughtfulness kindness is not a weakness if somebody is thoughtful and kind never think don't think different of that that doesn't mean they're not strong they're very strong they just decide that they could be thoughtful and kind and and guitars are special they're special. They resonate against your body. They're 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 living things, you know. And if if they need to move on to another source, you know, it's a great book. I love to read. I, I read all the time. Accordion Crimes. You should read that book by Ann Pro. Oh. Uh, it's fantastic. It goes from this accordion that's made in Sicily. It goes all throughout the world to different owners and different people and in different lives. That happens. It's it's really it's oh, a okay. great book. Accordion Crimes. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Oh, I'll check so I'm, I'm glancing at some of the questions here. I'm just trying to like see if we miss people and, and all that. So so how did you get your nickname Spider? Well, it's I wish it was some exotic, amazing story, but it isn't. Uh, I like to drive fast. So spiders with a Y. Right. So it's not an I. It's with a Y. I love to drive fast. So, you know, you got the spiders or sports cards. 
And then on a very first tour, Patricia and I were walking. We were in uh, uh, Virginia Beach, and I love the colors of yellow and black, um, but I'm not a Steeler fan. I love the colors of yellow and black. And it said Spider's Supper Club or Dinner Club or something. And it was with a Y. And I went, wow, check that out. And then she just says, you like black and yellow and you drive fast? I'm going to call you Spider. And that's that was it. There you go. <laughs> not a, nothing exotic at all. It's just. That's just it. Yeah. So the, so then so then you know I, I mean we we touched on this and you started your career with Pat and mm -hmm. and and how did uh, you started a relationship with Pat obviously that is continued into a long marriage mm -hmm. and uh, and and when did that all come about and how did that I mean I don't know if you want to talk about it or not but right well I, the, my career actually started with Rick that was that was a big that was a huge thing I mean obviously I I yeah got much more successful, you know, doing yeah. that together with Patricia. Um, well, it was, it was, it was, a, it was, um, it was a situation where uh, it's hard to explain. Uh, let's talk about the music part of it first. Yeah. There was, why am I turning white? There? Okay. The music part of this is that we both needed each other. It was very important. Mm -hmm. She needed me. And I needed her. Mm -hmm. Also, I wanted, like I said, I wanted a great singer. I can mold and shape and do this. And she wanted a musician and a, and a player to do that other part. So we needed each other. And we were just together all the time. And, and the other thing that's interesting, too, is they're complete opposites, you know. And, and that's what works so well with the music part of it. We're completely opposite. You know, I didn't grow up on show tunes and cabaret. I grew up with the blues and jazz and rock and roll, right? So it just it just merged into something and you know, it's just life developed. No, yeah, it just happened. developed. And it makes know? something unique. That's the thing that that's the, the thing about opposites or people who come from different backgrounds and you merge them together and they come it creates something completely new, right? Yeah. I mean uh she was able to deal with my wackiness. I never thought I was weird at all. And I still don't think I'm weird and, or wacky, but I, I guess I do have a lot of uh, slippage in the, in, in the, in the, in that department. So, um, and uh, in early on, um, it was, it was just very easy. You know, it was just easy. I have this idea. I want to, I want to try this. Let's do this, this, do this. Yeah, okay. 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 And, and you just, you just build a relationship because it's easy then, you know? Right. Right. So she's a fantastic singer. So. Oh, tremendous. Yeah. Tremendous. Amazing. Yeah. But it's also a, a, a very long-term success story, you know, yeah. you have still, you're still together. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I tell you what, it's, it's not easy. People, you know, they can look at it think it's like oh. this, you know, it's not easy at all. I'm, I'm a real, um, I'm not, I'm, I'm very social. I mean, I, I like people a lot. I like having conversations to talk, but I, I liked, there's a part of a Brian Wilson in me where I just want to be inside this place and not come out, mm. you know? And, uh, and she's really not like that. I'm kind of like, I can, like the COVID is, is terrible. It's a terrible thing to happen to this country and the people that have lost people. And it's just off. I hear of musicians all the time that I knew growing up in Cleveland that have ventilators that are really sick. It's horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. But that this whole period of time, I, I'm doing nothing different than I did without it uh, mm -hmm. i'm in the studio all the time i'm writing songs all the time i got a christmas record i can't wait to to do and and record i wanted to make sure i had all the songs written first and i'm gonna have all these special guests come on and sing and play i'm really excited about it because it's not your frosty the snowman type christmas record not that there's anything wrong with that yeah. but it's talking about and even not so much Christmas, it's holiday. It's what happens from Halloween to Thanksgiving to New Year's Day. Everybody's lives, people break up. Mm -hmm. People find new love. People want to change their life. They're looking for a new year. The new year's coming. You know, there's heartbreak, there's joy, there's happiness, there's sorrow. So it's a pretty 
quirky spin on what a holiday record would be, but I'm super excited about it. In fact, taking your name, Friedman, Marty, Marty Friedman's going to do something. Uh, who's a phenomenal player. He's right. going to, I'm going to have him jump on and, and do something. I can't tell you what the song is called yet, but it's really, really cool. Uh, so Awesome. That's fantastic. And so you also said you're going to be writing a book. Or you are yeah, I've been, well, I've been writing a book for 10 years. It's just, damn, there's so many things I do in my life. It's so hard to sit down and like, you know, but I am. Yeah. It's, um, but it's, it's written. It's the, it's my, sto my story. Right. But it's, but that's not the important part of it. The important part of it is to, is to sh give people hope uh, because I was, I was born not breathing. I, you know, I had, I came out backwards. I had a cord wrapped around my neck. I wasn't going to live. It was very bad. My name was supposed to be Nunzio after my grandpa Nunzio, but the doctor, the pediatrician, his name was Cornelius Cassidy and he saved my life. And my parents were so grateful to Dr. Cornelius Cassidy that they called me Neil short for Cornelius, but I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to, I wasn't supposed to make it. Wow. And I did. Wow. Um, I did. And part of having that issue and not being able to breathe and coming out blue and all that other stuff, you get all these neuroses and stuff that I have to battle with, you know, so I've done that my whole life. And the only thing that's kind of saved me is this, this world of music and creativity. So the story is, is written from somebody else. It's me writing it, but it's, it's just the story, but it's not really about, it's not important to me. Mm -hmm. on a solo level yeah you know what i mean and then i go into uh you know growing up and, and all the things that happened to me and then the music thing i go into detail of making of the records and crazy mm -hmm. stuff that i think you guys would probably really enjoy hearing uh, that's cool huh. look yeah, I'm looking, yeah. Forward to, looking forward to checking it out if i ever finish it takes takes me forever um, um come out eventually. on eventually yeah it will i'll finish it so we've got a uh, super chat, Davey C Music. Uh, he wants to know any instruments that Dave or I um, have had that have an amazing story before we got it. Uh, I don't think I have any gear that has any amazing stories before I got it. Yeah, no. I don't have anything either. Not really. I got I mean, one. I have old stuff that I don't know what the story was before I got it. What's yours, Neil? Well, I found his Norm's guitars. He had the Strat. It was phenomenal Strat, right? So had a real fat neck on it. And I was, oh, it was really cool. So I bought it. And I'm playing, and I'm on the road, and everything's cool. And all of a sudden, I get a call, and he says, you know, the guitar was stolen, and they want it back. And I says, oh, no, no, no way. I love this guitar. It's and I got a great picture of it, of me playing it. And it's up here like this. It's tremendous. It's an old, old picture. I says, oh, no, who do I have to give it back to? This is horrible. It was Brian Wilson's. Leo Leo Fender gave it to him. Wow. <laughs> this is like a That's serial a great number. story. Six. Ridiculous. So, so he sent his road manager to come and get it. And he goes, I want it right now. I says, I can't give it to you until I'm done with the gig. You're going to have to wait. I made sure I played the whole gig, and then I handed it to him. <laughs> That's wow. great. And then I called Norman. I said, Norman, what? the hell are you doing so you my money back <laughs> yeah he, he ended up giving me all kinds of stuff he i think i got more than one strap from him i got a couple uh, yeah yeah he felt there terrible that's a great story wow that that, that 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 is a fantastic story so i love that crazy yeah, the only good stories that i have about gear is stuff that i've gotten from dave so <laughs> <laughs> so uh he signed my guitar he signed my amp i'm all happy about that stuff so um let's see uh, we've got a question from James Gretsch. Neil, ever do any work for Bowie? I know you were his side, uh, never his side man like Earl Slick, but have you ever done work for him, studio work for him? No, I didn't. I didn't. I wish I, I wish I would have. Yeah. I mean, he would have been a, it would have been fun great. to work with because he's a great admirer of, of playing and players and rootsy stuff. And Earl's a great player. So yeah, I didn't. Um, and of course, of course, Mick Ronson too. Um, no, I had never had the opportunity. I wish I had. No. Okay, uh, that's awesome. Um, one more super chat. I see. Yeah, I looked. I looked. Oh, you have another one. Oh. Yeah, Deborah Baranowski. 
Uh, Neil and Pat Benatar, best partnership in history. Thank you for the music and inspiration. Any plans of touring in the near future? And if so, is there a tour schedule? Uh, God. I, well, we, there's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the COVID question of the moving target. Uh, yeah. yeah. So uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. I can't answer that because I, I know that they're, they're, you know, they, our agent and everybody is, is working at, hopefully when the the world opens up again to be back out there of course um but as, as of now i can't tell you for sure when that would be so yeah yeah well hopefully last quarter 2021 is my guess yeah could be fingers crossed get yeah. these vaccines out everybody yeah, it will. It, I, I have faith and hope that it, it's all going to work out. So every time anybody talks like, oh, it's going to be forever. Eh, someday you're going to look back and probably forget that it even happened. Yeah. Well, no, look, I, I tell this to my, my kids because it's hard for kids to comprehend. Like, is this mm -hmm. going to be like this forever? I said, no pandemic, no epidemic has ever lasted forever. The flu thing happened, that happened in 1918. Correct. It lasted a few years. It was over. The bubonic plague didn't last forever. <laughs> you know? Polio, you know, right. all those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually it'll end. So Yeah, we'll just like 9-11. 9-11 happened. You thought it was the end of the world, and, you know, it wasn't. So. We'll get past <laughs> it. We will get past it, and we will hear more Neil and Pat music soon, hopefully. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I want to be respectful of your time, Neil. Uh, are you – Are you? You need to go. After, well, if you have a couple – we'll do a couple more questions if you if you want. Yeah. Yeah, let's do two more or something, and then okay. – um, they want to know when they can, where can they pre-order the book or when the book's going to come out? Um, any plans? Well, that's, that's another question. Um, yeah, you'll know when it's able to pre-order the best thing to do. Uh, I don't have a date on any of that is, is I have, there's two Facebook pages. One is one I share with Patricia. And then there's another one that's, I do myself. It's called the official Neil Geraldo, not like there's an unofficial one, but that's the official Neil Geraldo one. And that one, because I want to be respectful of uh, the questions and things I talk about on the joint page. So, so if there's any questions that anybody has about, uh, you know, music and details and things that I post on there, that's the place you can find out more stuff for me. Is that one the unofficial Neil Geraldo Facebook page? Um, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping to have it finished by the beginning of next year. I think, I hope. That's, yeah. Okay, that'd be great. No, I'm sorry. What month are we in? January. Yeah, yeah. The beginning of next year, like this time. Hopefully, I'd like to get around the holidays. That would be good. But uh, let's see what happens. Well, now you said it, so you have to do it now. I have to do it. I have it. <laughs> you got to get it done. Have it kind of written, but but what it is is you when you write like a book, which I, you know I'm an avid reader and I love great authors. I love William Faulkner, Victor Hugo. I mean, these people I love, and I'm really critical of what I write. Mm -hmm. So it's really difficult. I may think, oh, I like that. I'm writing, 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 and then I look at it the next day and go, ugh. <laughs> it's not so good yeah, <laughs> then i freak out and then i throw it away and i start again uh, which um, is hard. this is why it's hard to get it done right hard exactly. it's hard. Yeah. Uh, so i know i heard this story clearly in the uh sunset sound movie that dave Grohl did but he wants to know about uh cecil music can you ask neil about recording jesse's girl with rick's dog sitting in front of him Right. Yeah. Rick's dog came right up to me. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, I love what, what that dog taught me was uh, I really love pit bulls and I didn't have a pit bull. He, it was a pit bull terrier. And uh, after talking to Rick and, you know, hanging with the dog, I ended up getting a, a pit bull. I named him fearless. And he was one of the greatest dogs in the world. He's so sweet and kind and everything, unless somebody would come up to my daughter or anything, then he'd let them know yeah, what's going yeah. on. But yeah, he would just bring the dog and he'd throw basketballs and the dog would crunch the basketball and, you know. <laughs> As pit bulls do. And then Rick was in a little ISO booth in Sound City. So he was way in the back in this little ISO booth singing the track. And then I was there with Mike Baird, him and I, and the dog was loose in the control room. And I mean, in the studio and just walked right up and put his nose right in my crotch when I'm playing the, the song. And I couldn't move. I'm thinking, what? This is bad. This could be, <laughs> this could be really bad. Could be bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was, it was, 
it was a very funny, funny moment. And he, of course, Rick was laughing because he could do that. <laughs> and Mike Baird was laughing too. He couldn't get him because he's behind the kit. You know, he's got he's got stuff around him. I was, right, right. He's protected. I was on my own. Yeah. Uh, Chris, okay. we'll make this the uh, uh, last. Oh, I do have one other question for you, Dave, before we go. Christopher J. Williamson, hey, uh, Neil, biggest thing I've gotten from your playing through the years is your passion and the way you really go after it when playing. Well, thank you, Christopher. Yeah, I I don't uh, I I call it Jerry Lee Lewis blood because um, when there's a moment, you you have to stand up and be in that moment. You know, I I never 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 ever ever went on stage ever and dumb down the audience. I don't do it with records I make. I don't do it with songs I write. I never dumb anyone down. I'm there. When I'm there, you're getting it. I've played with broken hands on stage. I've played when I was sick. I played with staph infections. I've done so many crazy things on stage. When I'm there, I'm there. Right. And when I'm in the studio, I'm in the studio. I'm not, you know, that's just the way I am. My father yeah. taught me that way. You know, he's like that. And uh, he's 94 years old and he's crazy as hell. Oh, and uh, That's awesome. Good for yeah. him. You always taught me to, to, you know, be there. People are paying money. They, they, you know, you give them the best you can, whatever you do every night. I would listen. I used to torture the band after every gig. I would listen, make them listen to the performance and say, <laughs> you're speeding up here. You're slowing down. You're out of tune. You're playing the wrong part. I mean, it, it was crazy in a nice way. I wasn't, I wasn't a prick about it, but I, but I was assertive. Right. Well, you're perfect. <laughs> I can tell you're a perfectionist. You want yeah. things the right way. I do. I do. It's so, um, so make sure you you guys check out Neil and uh, Pat on Facebook. Um, or I mean, if it's just Neil, questions for Neil. It's like he's yeah. his own official Neil yeah. Geraldo. Oh, the yep. official, the official Neil Geraldo. Perfect. And um, the other question, the last question I had for you, Dave, was a question that came to me through Facebook from Scott Rager. He wants to know um, if no. you're okay. There you go. There you go. <laughs> okay. <What? laughs> Sorry. There's a Marshall Origin series. Thoughts on quality tones and any plans to use a similar power scaling feature with Friedman? Thanks, man. Never. Uh, it. It, it's it's okay. It's not great, and I don't really see the point of using the power scaling feature. We already have a great master volume, so I don't see the point. And. Uh, that's it. I'm, I have a question from Neil Geraldo to David. <laughs> when, when is he going to build a 212 combo, especially to the specs for Neil Geraldo? That would be really great. I could do that. Okay. It's on film. It's recorded. I Mark, could do that. You're the witness. <laughs> I, I will save the clip and send it to you both. <laughs> I, can, I can definitely do that. Yeah. Because your amps are great. I mean, they're you big. Got, you got to get me one of your combos and then I can kind of like snoop around and then uh, come up with an idea for you. Sounds perfect. Let's do it. Yeah, we're we're pretty pretty far away from each other, right? No, we're in no. LA. Yeah, we're close, really close. Yeah. So, where are you? Where are you at, Brown? I'm in uh, right now. I'm in Calabasas. Oh, okay, yeah, not far. Easy. Yeah, perfect. Well, make make it happen. I want to see that happen. Yeah, um, we got to make it happen, guys. Check out I'm Sweet. Feel Mark. free to send some liquor. I'll get you some. I'll get you some. This is whiskey drum. We'll, we'll promote it on the show. Okay, yeah. this is phenomenal. This here is a 15-year-old Kentucky. Look at that. Oh, that looks good. Okay. Yeah. Oh man. This, this is spectacular. I'll get you uh, I'll get you. Do you like rye or or bourbon? Both. Both? Okay. I'll get you uh, I'll get you well, one of each. Like, I'm not kidding. We'll actually promote it on the show. Yeah. So right. We're one. drinking. Okay, good. Uh, then you're getting it for sure. I'll get you the reserve, which was a 94 rating, and I have a oh, blend. Great which was uh, 89 or 90. Then I have a sensational rye. I have a, I have a bourbon in a Pinot barrels. That's fin has a phenomenal story to that, but I, we're, we're, we can't go into it now, but what else do I have? I kind of think I have a bourbon that we're putting in cognac barrels now and all kinds of oh. stuff. Oh man. Yeah. Awesome. Great stuff. Yeah. Get, make sure you guys check it out as well. Check out. Yeah. Three chord bourbon. Three chord bourbon. <laughs> Three chord bourbon. <laughs> Three chord bourbon. Three chord bourbon. I like, yeah. I like the name too, Three Chord Bourbon. I, that's that's cool. the truth. It's the, the truth. Three chords and the truth, exactly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there 
perfect. Yeah. Perfect marketing campaign. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Check out Sweetwater. Uh, they are our sponsor for the show, and uh, we get a little kickback uh, commission if you guys purchase anything from them. They are a great sponsor. You can buy all kinds of stuff from them. So uh, check yeah, it great out. Company. Yep. Great company. And, uh, yeah. Everybody, uh, let me just tell you when our next show is going to be, and then I'll let Neil go. Um, this is how I find out when the next show is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> uh, Richard Fortas is with us on January 29th at great. 9 p.m. And uh, and then from there is uh, Dan from Matt Pedal Show and his Gig Rig product. Uh, will be February 13th. That's a Saturday, I believe. So, uh, so cool. Everybody have a great great rest of the week. Enjoy the weekend. Neil, just hang on while we hang up and I'll see you guys. Take All care, right. everybody. Yeah. Ciao.